yeah chemical bonding two we're going back um yeah wait did i start the recording okay in chemical bonding two we start off with um orbital diagrams so i want to make sure that we have ample time with chemical bonding one so chemical bonding two we really use the time that we need Chemical bonding one, if you've had high school chemistry, you have been aware of this bonding theory. We focus here on Lewis's theory. Lewis is the scientist with the dots. And after that, we talk about Vesper or Vesper, okay? It's, it's written Vesper, but we call it Vesper because it's a lot easier to pronounce that way. So going straight to Lewis's bonding theory. Lewis is a scientist who talked about elements having uh, valence dots around them of electrons. So remember, going back to what we saw before, the example would be lithium being a group one element, also a group one metal. Because it's in group one, it would just have one valence electron, right? And Lewis tends to illustrate this as dots. So let me make sure, once again, three-point check. Uh, am I sharing? Yeah, let me make sure I'm sharing. Okay. Make sure I'm sharing, and then I'm recording, and then, of course, you can hear my voice. Okay. And then uh, let's go with oxygen. Oxygen is in group six, and Lewis said, because oxygen is in group six, oxygen is surrounded by six electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six. According to Lewis, once we figure out the number of valence electrons, so these are illustrating valence electrons, all the elements which are equal to the number, the group number, so number, I should say group number versus number of groups, group number, then we can figure out the preferred mode of bonding, okay? So Lewis's theory, he summarizes that uh, valence electrons are used in bonding. Once we figure that out, the type of bonding we have predicts the properties of the molecule depending on what kind of bond we have. So all bonds are not alike, okay? The molecular stability, how stable is the molecule? And if you want to break the bond, what kind of effort do you have to do or put as a scientist in breaking the bond? The shape of the molecule, the size of the molecule, the polarity of the molecule. Essentially, this is a CV, the behavior of the molecule by itself or with others. These can all be boiled down to what elements are present, right, in the ingredients of the molecule, how they form bonds, what kind of bonds they prefer to form, and then how they behave once they're together, okay? Like a relationship. Each couple has its own flavor. How they behave with other couples, I don't know. How they behave with each other. We're learning all this stuff as the elements get together, right? So we're going back to the type of bonds. Now we talked about types of bonds in the context of naming, right? It took me a while to really get what I want to say is the flavor of chemistry, the theme of chemistry, how we think in chemistry. In chemistry, before you name a compound, you have to analyze the composition. Coming from biology into chemistry, I would just memorize and try to jump in there and, and get the answer wrong. And my teacher would have to always remind me, like, calm down, little girl. Uh, you, have, you haven't looked at the type of compound. I'm like, but why do I have to name it by the compound? I just didn't get systematic nomenclature. Now I do. I mean, of course, now I have to, right? I'm the teacher. <laughs> but, I mean, at some point, I got it. You can't just name it. You have to classify it, judge it, classify it. Then you name it based on how you classified it. Now, when we're dealing with bonds, we also have to classify before we decide the types of bonds that's going to be formed, right? So we're back to classifying. Depending on the type of elements you have, you have a specific type of bond. The three possibilities that we're looking at here, the three main types are ionic, covalent, and metallic. So what type of elements form ionic, covalent, and metallic? As we're looking at this, we're focusing on the main ones, right? With every chemistry rule, you have an exception. So let's start with the main one. Main one is uh, to form an ionic bond. We talked about this before, right? Forming an ionic compound. Now we're talking about ionic bond, which forms ionic compounds. Okay, ionic bond. We tend to see ionic bond mostly from metals plus nonmetals. 
So just like naming, now we're trying to decide what type of relationships do we get here? When you have a metal trying to form a bond with a non-metal, they will most likely form a bond in the ionic bond fashion, okay? If you're trying to form a bond between a non-metal and non-metal, you get a covalent bond. So covalent bonds, these tend to form mostly between non-metal and non-metal, okay? So I'm gonna go back and explain the logic why from the point of view of size, okay? Because as I told you, I'm not very good at memorizing. So why does it sound like I memorize when I talk about this? I work very hard to get the logic and then I memorize the logic, which is a lot less information than the actual uh, individual scenarios, right? <laughs> which in chemistry, I feel like it's better in chemistry because they're always throwing new random scenarios. So if you're memorizing, you're having to memorize every different variation of what they gave you. I just think it's better to learn it, the logic and then apply it. Okay, that's my opinion. Okay, finally, you have metallic bonds. Okay, so let's look at this. And metallic bonds, you have mostly, I shouldn't say mostly, but I'll just say mostly metal plus metal. Okay, so let's look at the one that's mostly metal plus non-metal. Metal plus non-metal, and the order will be, when you look at the first element, it will be a metal, second element will be non-metal. Okay, that's how it will mostly be written. Example for ionic bonds, sodium, chloride. Where sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal. Okay, so how can you look at a formula and say confidently, because you have a metal, non-metal forming a bond, you form the ionic bond? What's the logic there? I told you it has to do with size. We learned this before, that metals tend to be very large. So sodium is large. I'm gonna draw, draw sodium here as being super large. And then non-metals tend to be very tiny, okay? Because remember, I mentioned this way back when fluorine is the tiniest element, and then down here, cesium is the largest element, right? Fluorine is a non-metal, cesium is a metal. So when you go towards fluorine, you get a smaller size element. When you go towards cesium, you get a very large element. You see how I kind of use that logic right there? Because before, as a student, I was trying to use my poor undeveloped biology skills to learn chemistry and I'll flunk chemistry. And I, I stopped doing that and started learning chemistry the way it was supposed to be learned, which is logic. Smallest, biggest, right? Smallest element, non-metal, largest element, metal. Okay, how does that influence how they're coming together? Chlorine is it gonna be a small one. So I like to use, as I started to understand chemistry more and I became a little bit more confident, I started to bring myself in the story. You know how I like to do that. Because sodium is large, it's more likely to be the giver. Large elements tend to be givers of electron and they give their last electron, right? They give the valence electron. So sodium being large will be the one that gives electrons. Chlorine being small is the one that takes the electron. This is natural of the behavior of large elements versus small elements. Giver of electron, large element. Taker of electrons, small elements. This all boils down to that nuclear charge, right? So we talked about this before. So imagine you are the scientist dealing with elements, like the scientist slash counselor dealing with elements as you're trying to form a relationship. You're telling them this is how they behave, right? In this bond, sodium will do what sodium does. Sodium will give its electron. Chlorine will give, well, sorry, will take the electron, right? I hope I said electron, yeah. Gives electron, takes electron, not element. I don't know, okay, yeah. Sodium will give electron. So uh, chlorine will take electron and they will all act in the natural behavior and do, in doing so, they will actually form a bond. Sodium gives electron, chlorine takes electron, right? And then this will form the ionic bond. As sodium gives one electron, it becomes a positive ion, ergo the term ion. As chlorine takes one electron that's consistent with its nature, it forms a negative ion. And then they both become stable, but something else beyond their stability draws them together, which is the opposite charge. 
okay? The opposite charge brings them together and they form this strong bond, the ionic bond. When we go to covalent bond, you have two small elements such as chlorine and chlorine trying to form a bond. Well, what happens in the relationship when both people in the relationship are somewhat self-centered? Can they form a relationship? Right, they can form a relationship. Can it be as strong as the one where the one is a naturally a giver and the other one is naturally a taker? Not as strong, but they can form a relationship. Since both elements are takers, they have to find a compromise that works for both of them. Chlorine is a taker, so is the other chlorine. So the compromise they do here is share. In sharing the electrons, they are both given and they're both taken. They actually, neither is given and neither is taken. When it says sharing here, what they're doing is each chlorine will use its unpaired electron and bring the unpaired electron so close together that they both have access to each other's electrons. So it would be like they open a, a, a joint account and each one leaves some money in that joint account. And in this case, the money is the electron, right? Each chlorine brings in the electron that's unpaired and that's how they form the bond here. So they're sharing the electron, that way neither is losing out. But the electron never leaves either element. That's an important part here. They're not giving the electron away. So chlorine is not giving the electron away to become positive and the same thing with the other one, no. They're actually just bringing the electrons close to each other and then each one has access to the other element's electron, and that's considered sharing. With metallic bonding, with both elements being very generous and large, sodium will behave like sodium, and the other sodium will behave like sodium. Each sodium is generous, so they are both givers. What do they both do cl to close to each other? They both give. Well, who do they give to? There is no taker here. They give to the general space. So the, the left sodium gives up its one electron to the general space, becoming positive. The right sodium gives up its one electron to the general space, becoming positive. Well, who takes? All of them take. Okay, so the weird thing is with a metallic bond, this is actually very fascinating. In the metallic bond, uh, when, when I finally got this as a student, I was like, whoa, this is like a communal village a village where people are su really supporting each other. Your neighbor considers their wealth, your wealth, and vice versa. So all the members of this sodium metal are giving their electrons to a common space, a communal space, and then they kind of share the electrons communally, okay? So this is actually later called C model of the metal. Electron C model, sorry, electron C model. So it looks like the ions of the metal are swimming in a sea of electrons because the electrons just came from the metals as each of them gave freely from their, I want to say from their heart, but I realize they're not people, but you know what I'm saying. Each of them gave the electron freely based on their capacity. So for the sodium ion being in group one, each one gives up one electron. If the same scenario we're talking about was calcium ion group two, then each one will give up to their capacity. Calcium will each give two electrons, calcium two electrons, calcium two electrons, calcium two electrons. Then you have twice the number of electrons out here in the, oops, this is electron right out, out here in the C. Anyway, bottom line we're seeing here, the kind of bond we get here is based on the type of elements that are coming together, okay? Metal, non-metal, ionic. Now metal, non-metal, covalent. Metal, metal, metallic. Okay, electrons shared, electrons transferred, electrons pooled. Okay, so when electrons are being shared, they can be shared equally or not equally. So here's where we start having the self, well, I shouldn't say the selfish elements. Well, yeah. So now we're going to be looking at covalent bonding and then polar covalent bonding. So the issue we're seeing that arise, it's not really an issue, but an observation, because it's only an issue when there's a problem, right? Is for the elements that are undergoing covalent bonds, covalent bond. With covalent bond, because this becomes an issue, the issue comes up when you are dealing with sharing of electrons. There are two ways to share. 
when the elements are exactly alike, then the electrons are shared equally because the elements have equal capacity or equal access to the shared electrons. So what I'm going to do here, before I actually even do this, I'm doing a shorthand here. Let me do this the long way. Imagine I'm trying to show you the bonding in chlorine, okay, Cl2. The left chlorine, I'll use a, a different color from the right chlorine. The left chlorine, I'm going to use Lewis's dots to illustrate how it comes into form a bond. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? My left chlorine. Then my right chlorine over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if these two chlorines want to form a bond, they're two different chlorines, right? Forming this formula here, then they have to place the uh, unpaired electrons in a common space. And this common space is where you're going to have your shared electrons. So this essentially is where we have our shared electrons. The shared electrons are the ones that become the bonded electrons. So you can see right here, right? Now I'm going to show you how the shared electrons become uh, the bond. This is what graduates to be called the bond. And this will be called the covalent bond. OK, the context here is how is sharing taking place? Because the chlorines are exactly alike, or they have the same ability, they have the same access, then this covalent bond is, is equal, right? So I'll say here, electrons are shared equally. So there is no inequity in the sharing of the electrons. Each element has equal access to the electrons because the elements are technically alike, right? Chlorine and chlorine. One doesn't have an ability over the other, okay? So the issue comes up when one element is slightly different. So let me give you the scenario here. And I'm going to use, let's say, carbon and I'll use oxygen and fluorine, okay? So let's say oxygen and fluorine are about to form a bond. Oxygen and fluorine. These are obviously different elements, right? Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. Valence electrons, fluorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So first of all, for us to form this compound, you can see here, I should have used a, di a different color. Let me use a different color for the oxygen. Not use the same color, right? Different color, different color here. Here's my oxygen. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Let me do it that way, okay? So you can see from here, our future plan is these unpaired electrons will be paired to form a bond. But what about this electron right here? I'm going to need an additional fluorine. So I put my fluorine right here. Oh, in the, in the opposite color. Hold on, hold on. These are the little things I obsess with. Why? Because I want it to be OK. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK. So you can see right here, these will form a bond. Those will form a bond. Now I can combine this as I've already shown you the process. These will essentially be oxygen a bond here, a bond here. Remember the bond are the shared electrons, okay? These are, are shared electrons, okay, also shared. Now the question is between these two here, as we're focusing on sharing of electrons, just between the oxygen and the fluorine on the right, not the one on the left, uh, is this sharing being done equally? Are we having fair sharing? You know, politically right now, I don't know why everything has to be politicized, but it is. I realize that's life, and I'm trying to make peace with that. Everything has to be politicized because such is life. So let, why don't we go ahead and politicize this part here, right? Do Does fluorine and oxygen have the same kind of access to the shared electrons? Because lately, one of the questions that's being asked is, okay, there's all these resources, vaccines, I don't know, food, shelter, clothing, jobs. Does everyone have the same access? That's the question. 
I mean, they're there, but do people have the tools necessary to access these resources? Now we're dealing with elements. Do the elements have the same resources to access what is shared? Is it really being shared equally? Okay, let's see what fluorine has. Fluorine has a very high nuclear charge. We said that before, because fluorine has a high nuclear charge, that strong positive core, remember? That high positive core makes chlorine's core very strong. Because it has a very high nuclear charge, it actually has the highest access possible to the shared electrons. Now, technically, to make the shared electrons, we got one electron from fluorine and one from oxygen. But now, fluorine has more access to what is shared. So these are not being shared equally. I mean, when I learned this, I'm like, no way. What about the, uh, the electron that oxygen brought in? Elect I mean, oxygen did bring in one electron. The one electron from oxygen is valid, just as valid as the one electron from fluorine. But once they get together, fluorine has more access to the shared electron than oxygen. Even in the elements, we don't always have equality, right? So because fluorine has more access to the electron. When we draw this bond here, it doesn't say anything. Fluorine is then given the symbol partially negative. This symbol here indicates fluorine has greater access to shared electrons. So the term for that is electronegativity electronegativity. And when I was learning this, I think, we, I think I really, really got this either late middle school, where, where we come from middle school is like uh, 10th grade, right? I think I got it by late middle school about that time because I was like, and that name is so appropriate, electronegative, right? So I'm, I'm beginning to judge fluorine. I'm, I'm having this kind of low-key hate relationship for chlorine, but I'm like, yeah, you're so negative. When you get with other elements, you take their electrons. Anyway, yeah, when you're supposed to be sharing, right? Yeah. And then in this context here, oxygen will be partially positive because the positive in chemistry indicates loss of electrons. So this one has got less access. So this is less electronegative. Okay. The other analogy I usually give to students is imagine parents that made kids together and then something happens, the relationship has problems, and now the kids, the court decides which parent gets the kids more, right? So then one parent has more access to the kids than the other. I mean, they both have access, but usually one ends up having more, right? So that's kind of the shared electrons here are kind of like that, like offspring, like kids, where fluorine, because of this strong nuclear charge, just ends up getting more custody to the shared electrons, right? So if you're taking organic chemistry, this is key, this is important because in organic chemistry, sometimes they need an element to break the bond. Guess who they bring in? Fluorine. So by the time I got this, I mean, I'm in organic chemistry, it's just like, well, we're bringing fluorine. I'm like, mm-hmm, and it breaks the bond. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> Because by this time, I'm like, I know what fluorine does. When fluorine shows up, I know it's about to go down. There's a bond about to be weakened or broken, right? So to look at this trend, electronegativity, we're told here it increases across the periodic table and decreases down the group. So just like we saw before, fluorine is the most electronegative element. Back again, fluorine is the smallest in size and has the greatest nuclear charge and is the most electronegative. Okay, and then directly opposite that we have cesium, or in this case, they put in francium. That's fine. Francium. Francium is like the bottom of bottom most of group one. Francium right here is the least electronegative. Also the large, well, large-ish, I'll say second largest size, and then least <clears throat> nuclear charge, just the opposite of the behavior of fluorine. So this would be super large, this is super tiny, okay? But fluorine is very potent. 
And so when you're going the trends, you want to go look at the trends based on this. And so they can show you, they show you here. And of course, they have these numbers. Now, people usually ask me, should we memorize this? I will tell you this. For the most elements, you want to at least uh, memorize uh, period two. It's easy to memorize period two. Okay, and I'll show you how. Uh, fluorine is the highest electronegativity. Hopefully, you can see this number. It's at 4.0, kind of like the GPA. And then when you go down, to the left, I shouldn't say down. When you're going to the left, you just subtract 0.5. So 0.5, right? 4, 3.5, 3.0, 2.5, 2.0. And then 1.5 or 1.0. So you can kind of see that, right? Most of the time, they won't, if you're doing something like the MCAT, they may not give you the number. They'll ask you to, to memorize it. And as a student, I try to memorize, not the number, I try to memorize what bonds were polar, what bonds were not. I, I just had like bad study habits. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to call them. I just wasn't getting how to do it, how to get the information in my head. I was studying hard. I was just doing the wrong thing really, really a lot, right? And then once I figured out from people the right way to study this stuff, I'm like, where have you been all my life? Can I take you home with me? There was something illegal about that. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> I was like, uh, I have my own life. Okay, this one here, you can kind of see the next trend here. There is, there is a relationship in this period three. It's not a consistent one, but if you need to, it's right here. Period three from, uh, the, from the right to the left. Chlorine starts at 3.0. You go down like 0.5, 2.5. You go down 0.4 to 2.1. You go down 0.3 to 1.8. And then here you're back to 0.3 again, 1.5. So... Period three is not as consistent as period four. These numbers are figured out experimentally, so you don't have to memorize them. Memorizing them makes at least this period right here. Memorizing makes it easier for you to conclude what is polar, what is not polar, okay? But you need to identify polar bonds and, and nonpolar bonds. So bottom line here, the ability of an atom Okay, within a bond to attract bonding electrons to itself is called electronegativity. We concluded fluorine is electronegative. And the larger the difference in electronegativity, this is, <laughs> okay, I'm just telling you, if I was learning this right now, this is how I learned this. Electronegativity apparently is privilege. <laughs> so the larger the difference in privilege or electronegativity, the more polar the bond and the more the element that has the electrons will have, I mean, the more electronegativity the element, the more access that element will have to the shared electrons, okay? It's, it's just an interesting take on this. Do you have to memorize it that way? No, you can just look at the content and learn it that way. It's just my way of really being able to apply this in a deeper sense, okay? Negative end of the bond. So once you identify the bond, the negative end versus the more, the less negative end, you can go through that. So right here, negative, and then the, the, the negative end of the bond is usually has the more like negative atom, right? And so fluorine is the more like negative atom. We just said that it is the smallest. And then of course, it has the strongest nuclear charge. Now these are not personal. This is just human beings trying to understand elements, but we're giving the elements human behavior, right? So none of this is like somebody made this up or it's a system. No, no, it's just us trying to understand a behavior in the elements that's already going on. So here we have F and H forming a bond. By default, F, fluorine has like an activity value of 4.0, hydrogen 2.1. So when they form the bond, you see how this line here is drawn towards fluorine? Fluorine will end up being the one that has more access to the shared electrons right there. Okay, so we're seeing a summary of how sharing takes place. When you have two chlorines, they tend to form a covalent bond, right? Because you have e close to equal sharing, either perfect sharing or close to equal. So they're giving you these categories based on the difference in electronegativity. So even if you have a difference of up to 0.4, this is still classified as not different enough to be significant. This is classified as covalent. 
Over here, you have um, polar covalent, where the sharing is still taking place, but one element has more access to the electrons than the other. So if you figure out a difference between 0.4 and 2.0, then you have polar covalent. Then finally, we have ionic. Ionic at this point here, the bond broke, okay? So here we have a picture showing the different, different kind of sharing. The pure covalent or nonpolar covalent, you have elements that are most likely alike, like chlorine and chlorine. They share equally. By the way, these bubbles are called electron density. It just shows you where the electron is. So from here, you can see the more yellow or the more big the yellow sphere is, the more the electron is. So the electron is shared equally to different pe not people, sorry, different elements. Over here, you have more electron on whatever this left one is. So I guess I'll call that fluorine. Last, uh, right one, chlorine, right there, right? So fluorine, electronegative, chlorine. I mean, whatever you put on the right of fluorine, it's going to be, you know, less electronegative because fluorine is always the highest, right? So electrons are shared unequally. Then over here, you have ionic bond. So the difference in electronegativity of these two has to be so large that one breaks the other. So I can put here a metal to ensure that fluorine breaks up the bond completely. So here, <laughs> when I was learning this, sadly, I mean, as I, this, is, this is my way to engage the material. I had to been saying, I can't relate to chemistry. And I said, what do you mean? Well, I can't, it doesn't really relate to my real life. <laughs> I'm like, really? I can tell you how many ways <laughs> do you have a whole semester? <laughs> because, I mean, it's just the way I see the world, right? It's, to me, this is a, I want to call it a healthy relationship, but this is, well, what, what is a healthy relationship really? What is, right? So this is my interpretation of it. If the goal is to share, okay, I have to define the standard. If the goal is to share, which is what covalent bonds are all about, right? Covalent bonds are about sharing. If the standard or the requirement is sharing, these are doing it well. So based on that, this is healthy. These, huh, not doing it very well, polar covalent bond. These broke up. <laughs> there's, no, there's, no, there's no bond due to sharing anymore. Fluorine took what was supposed to be shared completely. So now you, the, what's keeping them together is not sharing of electron because nothing is being shared. What's keeping the elements together in the ionic bond is opposite charge. So you can see here in the ionic bond, the bond, the shared electrons are gone, transferred completely to fluorine, right? Fluorine took both its electron and sodium's, sodium's electron. So what forms the ionic bond here is the opposite charge. Okay, so here you're being asked to classify the bond as pure covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. You want to go through here. So I'm going to just describe this versus going through each individually. You want to find um, the periodic table back here. You want to use these numbers. So they have done that for you. They have found the numbers and assigned them to each element. So strontium, oh no, this is fluorine because I'm like, what is that? This is fluorine and strontium, okay? Fluorine is 4.0, strontium is 1.0. The difference... What they want is the difference in electronegativity, but they just want the gap between. So we never usually deal with a negative version of the number. You just want to take the absolute version or absolute value of the answer you get. Had you done SR minus F, you would get negative 3.0. Take the absolute value of that and you get 3.0. Okay. What about this second one? It was N and then CL. They, even though they're different elements, they have the same electronegativity. So surprisingly enough, they not only have a covalent bond, but they share equally. Different identity of the elements, but they share equally because they have the same access or capacity to the shared electrons. Last one here, we have nitrogen and oxygen. And let's see, what do we have here? 0.5 difference. And what we see here is because the difference has... Uh, I shouldn't say skip, but it's above the, the 0.4 level, we do have, we classify that as polar covalent, okay? So polar covalent, they're sharing, but not as equal as they could. This one here, uh, they're sharing equally. This, anything to and above, 
is going to be classified as ionic. That means the bond broke. They're not sharing equally anymore. What's keeping them together is electrostatic charge, which is then classified as ionic bonding. Okay. Next thing we're looking at, which we'll be ending on this one right here, which will help you finish the lab that was due this weekend, is drawing Lewis structures. So for this one here, I'm going to go straight into this practice part. You want to um, work on writing the Lewis structure. So the first thing that they do is they have to provide you with the formula CO2. What elements are in your formula? How many of each? Here we're told we have one carbon, we have two oxygens, right? They tell you first, write the correct skeletal structure for the molecule. So here's the thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Here's the thing. If you have, if you look at this, elements prefer symmetry. They prefer stability. Symmetry means um, kind of like a little OCD with the elements. They prefer having, since you have one carbon and you have two oxygens, the preference here is to have the carbon in the middle and the oxygen on either side. This is preferred over this, like cool. This is not preferred, okay? <clears throat> well, how do scientists decide what elements prefer and what they do not prefer? They do, they try to build this molecule here and see if the molecule will exist, if it will continue, if it will actually remain. So it's almost like when they build the molecule, they determine its bond energy and determine if the molecule is stable. If the molecule is concluded to be unstable, that means it breaks apart to something else or rearranges to a more stable form, they conclude the molecule does not prefer that. Because, I mean, you can argue, how do scientists know what molecules want if they aren't communicating with words, right? So this is not the most stable form of this arrangement of the molecule. This is more stable. Ergo, elements prefer this or compounds prefer that. Okay, next thing you want to do is find the total number of valence electrons according to the Lewis structure. So I'm going to go ahead and work the rest of this out. So we concluded CO2 will be arranged like this, carbon in the middle, oxygen on either side. So number one, skeletal structure. Second thing, uh, total valence electrons. You want to find this for each of the particip participating elements. So we have, we're doing a roll check. Two oxygens, check. One carbon, check. Okay. So we have oxygen. How many of these do we have? We have two. Each of them, according to Lewis, brings in six electrons. How do we know that? The Lewis structure draws oxygen as having six valence electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So each oxygen brings in six valence electrons to have 12 electrons. Each carbon, we only have one carbon in the structure, right? Brings in four electrons, right? Because carbon is in group four. So we have 16 total valence electrons to work with. So that's done. Check. Next thing we do is draw single bonds between, if I can spell between, central atom and peripheral atoms. Draw a single bond between central atom and peripheral atom. What is central atom again? The atom in the middle. What's peripheral atom? <laughs> the one that's not. Okay, so peripheral is like on the edge, right? The outer one. So the central atom in our case was carbon. The peripheral atoms were the two oxygens that were not in the center, okay? We have 16 total valence electrons to work with, right? You have to remember here that one bond uses up two electrons. So each time we draw a bond, we're using up two electrons. So we got a bond here and a bond here. They, do, they did say draw single bonds, right? So in my uh, electron bank, I started off with 16 electrons. I just used up four electrons. I'm left with 12, okay? My next move is to place six electrons on peripheral elements 
that are not hydrogen. Okay, let me check real quick. Are my peripheral elements hydrogen? No. So I can place six electrons on these peripheral elements, on each of them. On, I should write here, each. So I'm going to write here. This is where I'm at in my transformation. I had 16 electrons. I used four to make the bonds. I'm left for 12. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I had to kind of develop a little jingle because I teach this all the time and I get a little bit, you know, bored sometimes. So, yeah, six, six, 12. Okay, so according to my electron bank, my bank is empty. In the process of drawing the Lewis structure, make sure that you empty out your electron bank, total valence electrons, before you try to double bond. That will help you have less mistakes. I have students double bonding in the beginning. I'm like, who are you double bonding with? And then who, you know, then in the end, they have a central atom that looks like a, what's the animal, the insect called? <laughs> I've forgotten a lot of names. Spider, spider, that's what I'm talking about. I am like, why do you have a spider? They're like, what spider? <laughs> it, it, okay, in the end, it looks something like this. That looks like a spider to me. I don't know. So I'm like, don't do that. Don't, don't skip steps. Number five. Okay. Um, you want to check for octet. It helps. This currently has eight electrons. How do you know it has eight electrons? It has, we have two electrons here via the bond, right? By the way, bo bonded electrons have shared custody. Even if it's not very good custody, it's still shared custody, right? This oxygen has access to the two electrons here, just like the carbon has access to the very same two electrons. So these electrons are counted towards the number of electrons the oxygen has. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I shouldn't do that. I'm kind of adding dots, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight electrons. Same thing with this one here. One, two, oops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But what about the carbon? The carbon currently only has four electrons. So now we use double bonds or triple bonds, whatever is necessary, to help central atom achieve octet. Octet. So Elements, remember, they prefer symmetry. So take this. You remove the two electrons from here, like you saw me just do. And then you share it. So the two electrons go from belonging to oxygen alone to now being shared between oxygen and carbon. Same thing over here. Remove the two electrons from oxygen, this oxygen here, and now share it with the carbon. Now this carbon now has eight electrons and each of the oxygens have eight electrons so you have essentially now uh formed what is it called yeah an, a lewis structure where each element that's not hydrogen has an octet of electrons right eight electrons eight electrons eight electrons here so yeah this is now our lewis structure so they show you how they did it here work it out here and they show that to you and there it is Okay, so I want to work on, let me see, I want to work on these. I want to start on resonance and formal charge because that in and of itself is a whole process before I want to start that part on Wednesday, okay, because that takes a long time. So I'm going to show the charge one and then this one here real quick. Let me go ahead and work on that part. Okay, so I'm going to show the NH3 and I'm going to show the Lewis structure of NH4 positive. So for NH3, nitrogen will be in the middle surrounded by three hydrogens. N, it, we only have one, it's in group five, so we have five. H, we have three in the formula, each in group one, so we have three. We're working with eight electrons, right? Form single bonds here, here, here. I use up six electrons because each bond uses up two electrons. I'm left with two electrons. 
So, oh, the other thing I didn't have in my rule, if you have electrons left over, you got to put them here. Right? So minus two electrons, we're left with that. Okay. Now let me check. We mentioned this before. Because elements below carbon, as far as the periodic table is concerned, the atomic number, that means hydrogen, helium, lithium, boron. Wait, I, I, I skipped one. Beryllium, boron, hydrogen, lithium, uh, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron. These elements cannot get two octets. So they tend to form uh, bonds that are not. Um, they tend to form bonds in such a way that they're not surrounded by eight electrons. Hydrogen forms a single bond, and that's it. It can't have any more electrons. So it follows the duet rule. What I mean by that is hydrogen has two electrons, and it's good. Two electrons, and it's good. Two electrons, and it's good. And it gets the two electrons by forming a single bond. Nitrogen has to have eight electrons because it is the poster child for the octet rule. So this lowest structure is complete with nitrogen being surrounded by two electrons here, two electrons here, two here, two here, to get a total of eight electrons. In this structure here where we have NH4, we have N, one times five, five electrons, H, uh, four times one, right? We have four hydrogens, one is four. We have nine total electrons. But what does this positive do? The positive one, i.e., lost one electron. So take the nine, subtract one, and we're left with eight electrons to work with. So now we have nitrogen in the middle, surrounded by four hydrogens, right? According to this formula right here, one nitrogen, four hydrogens. Then you draw the single bonds one, two, three, four. And that's how we use all eight electrons, and we are left with this. Because we have a positive charge, we tend to form brackets around the structure and put positive to indicate that to draw the structure, one electron was lost, okay? So since time is up, I'm gonna end there, and then when we come back, we'll continue with resonance structures, formal charges. I'll skim over that as I want us to get to the end of this very long chapter, okay? So if you all have questions, feel free to ask. I mean, yeah, of course, type the question in the charge. Not charge, sorry, in the, ch in the chat box. Oh, my goodness. Okay, this is all I have for today. So um, we'll get as far as we can on Wednesday. But if you do have any other questions, just let me know. Okay? So you have a nice day. I will see you on Wednesday.